Come on, come on. There she is. We're live, live. at the boat docks. It's frozen over. It's frozen. We got uh, a lot of snow. Two feet. Lots of snow. They call it boo now. What? Boo. Boo. We got lots snow. of boo snow. <laughs> <laughs> Enough with the corny jokes. His, your car literally got buried. My car was buried. Buried. I didn't even know I had a car anymore. <laughs> 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 well, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Guess who's here? Uh, your mom. My mom your is here. here. Hi, mom. Yes, hey, mom. <laughs> it's been a little bit since we did a Bible study. It's been a little bit. We've been busy. Yeah. We've been doing lots of stuff. We had travel a little bit. Yeah, lots of travel. Yep. yep, yep. Well, here we are. The Lord gave us time, space, and a Bible study. <laughs> so we're thankful to be back in like a normal routine, kind of. Kind of. We're thankful for everybody's patience, love, prayer, and time. Happy Marvin's Sabbath, Marvin. Here. Cindy's here. Cindy's here. Krista is here. Mama's here. <laughs> we got the same crew. Every yeah. Hey, Cindy. Hey, Robert Hirsch. Good to see you, buddy. I met a couple of your friends, uh, Mario and Yamel. Uh, yeah. At the, at the gym. gym. Yeah. 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 They were very nice. They were very nice people. I did not know that they were your friends until after the event was over. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So. Are you ready? I'm ready. Yeah, we have our yeah. thumbs up, which means we love you. Thumbs up means I love you. Yep, and here we go. Okay, Let's, pray. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Holy Sabbath day, a day of rest, a day of knowing that you have dedicated this special time to fill our hearts and minds with your love. So we thank you, Heavenly Father, for the extra measure of your spirit to be with us today. Lord, we thank you for the Bible study, and we thank you for the people who have purposely taken the time to be with us this Holy Sabbath day. So, Lord, as we pray, we ask for forgiveness. We know that you love us, and we know that you forgive us. So we're very thankful for that. We ask that you would bless us with the Spirit of Christ in a double, triple, quadruple portion, and that you would speak to us, Lord, as we get into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So today we're going to talk about God's love, God's spirit, and God's truth, which are very interesting topics. May I have the Bible, my love? Oh, yeah. May I have that one? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. What's up, George? Good to see you, buddy. Sarah Rogers is here. We got some people here. Hello, everybody. We got our Bibles. We got our Bible study notes, and I think we're ready to go. So we're talking about God's love, and that has a stereotypical view in the world today. God's love is relegated to the side, and it does not seem as important as it really is. And there's a reason behind that. 1,700 years ago, a specific mindset was introduced into Christianity, which took the most important character trait of God and put it off to the side. And as darkness enveloped Christianity, the love of God, and every facet which who God is became wrapped in darkness so that the minds of man no longer began to grasp the truth about God. And God's love here at the end of time is designed to penetrate and destroy the misconception which the Babylonian system of apostasy, of confusion, of lies has um, trapped the Christian world. And so the Bible says, come out of her, my people. Come out of Babylon. Come out of lies. Come out of confusion. Come out of this system which develops a wrong character because you're looking at a wrong God. And so we're going to look at the love of God, which sets the record straight of who God really is. First John chapter 4, verse 8. First John chapter 4, verse 8 says this. Here we go. First John chapter 4, verse 8 says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Now, we say it often that this love that God has is a principle. That's where we start. We start with the principle of considering others more important than you consider yourself. But we take it even a step further because as I have my wife, I do, by principle, consider her more important than I consider myself. And yet there is still a desire in my heart to hold her close to me. Because I love her so much and I consider her so important that her very presence is a pleasure to be around. This is how God is with us. He considers us to be a pleasure 
he be around. And he literally says that if we don't get to the kingdom, that it won't be as good as it could be. Hebrews 11, 40. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 40 says this, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. This is the love of our Heavenly Father. He says, you got to make it. you got to be here. Because I've prepared this beautiful place, and it won't be as special if you're not here. This is a love that transcends even the principle. This is a, a love that at its foundation has a principle. But as you go further and further into the depths of the love of God, it says that I consider you so important that the beautiful heavenly kingdom which I have prepared won't be as good if you're not there. This is for all of us. This is for the entire world. The Illuminati member, the corrupt presidents that rule this world, the politicians, the drug lords. This love that God has, that's for them too. So whenever we find ourselves condemning one, remember to look in the mirror because you're really condemning yourself. Psalms chapter 18 verse 30 says that God is perfect. And Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says that God is unchangeable. And this perfect, unchangeable love that God has is for the whole world. It, it's for the drug dealer. It's, it's for the Illuminati member. It, it's for the pedophile. It's for everybody. And when we limit God's love, we're actually limiting the love that we're capable of receiving. We see God's love perfectly displayed to us through Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate revelation of God. And in John 3.16, it says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we've heard this beaten like a drum so many times that we get numb to it. But imagine this. Your only child, the one that knows you better than anybody, your direct connection to uh, a, a legacy that will last into the future. This is taken from you by your enemy, and you no longer have a child because your enemy has taken the life of your child. And yet, how would that make you feel? That would devastate you. That would crush you. And yet, even though we killed God's son, he still chooses to love us. Right? That's a love that we can trust. That's a love that we can believe in. That's a love that we can have faith in. And when we look at what we did to Jesus, and that how God says he still loves us, we can put our trust that no matter what we do, no matter what we say, no matter what happens in this life, that God's perfect, unchangeable love toward us is something that we can believe, we can trust, and we can have faith in. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says this. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says this. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God demonstrated his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even while we were yet enemies, hostile in our mind towards God, not believing, not trusting, not having faith in him, when he gave us his son, he knew what was going to happen. And he allowed us to kill his only begotten son. And in this process of us facing what we did to Christ, we come to the realization of how dark our hearts really are. And we say, whoa, 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 I cannot ever trust myself. And as I look at the love of God, how he loves me beyond even the death of his son, this becomes a God that I can believe, I can trust, and I can have faith in. This is very beautiful. How we see the love of God even past the point when we killed his son. And last time we talked about how we were complete in Christ, right? What Christ did for us in the big picture, not just redeeming us from our sins, not just causing me to understand that God loves me and that no matter what I do, no matter what I say, no matter what I become, he's going to love me regardless. But when we looked at the big picture and we saw that we were complete in Christ, we saw that it wasn't just redemption. We saw that in sanctification, I am complete in Christ right now in sanctification, in justification, in strength. I can now trust God. I can now have faith in God. I can now believe God. The value that I see that God has for me is so complete that I know that I am accepted in the beloved when I am in Christ. 
perfect in holiness, perfect in righteousness, perfect in healing, perfect in cleansing, perfect in acceptance, not because of what I do, but because of what Christ did for me. So we strive to create our own righteousness. We strive to create our own justification. We strive to create our own sanctification. Those things are impossible. The only way that I can have completeness in the eyes of the Father is when I accept Christ, when Christ plants his seed in me, and that seed which is complete with the life of Christ that then becomes a part of who I am. And when God looks at me, he no longer sees the old man of sin, but he sees the life of his son being raised up and grown inside of me. So we are complete in Christ in every possible facet. We don't need to work for it. We cannot earn it. And there's nothing that we can do to add to it. We simply receive it as we believe the promises of God, which are in Christ Jesus. It's very important that we can only receive this as we believe by faith. And to the capacity that you believe is to the capacity that you receive. If you only can believe a little, you can only receive a little. If you can believe to full capacity, you can receive to full capacity. So we have seen the beauty of God's love in Christ. We've seen that we have completeness in Christ, redemption, justification, sanctification, holiness, clean, clean everything we have or need to be in the presence of God we have in Jesus Christ it might only be in seed form but once we receive that seed and the water of life the Holy Spirit comes and grows inside of us we will develop the mature fruit of the Spirit fully replicating the character of Christ which is work that only God can do now what do we do now we're here we have salvation we're complete in Christ now what do we do Romans chapter 12 verse 1 Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says this, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So now what do we do? We submit to God. We offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So it's reasonable for us now to live for God with the intention of being transformed, with the intention of establishing faith. Colossians chapter 2, verse 7. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, verse 7 says this. Rooted and built up in him. That's important. In him is Jesus Christ. Rooted and built up in him and established in faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So as we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, we see the love of God. We know we are complete in Christ. And now what do we do? We offer our lives as a living sacrifice to God with the intentional purpose of being transformed by the Spirit of God with the intention of being established and rooted in faith. That's very, very important. And we find ourselves in a situation where there's 33,000 different denominations, all with the name Christianity. What do we do? Where do we go? Who can we trust? This is very important that Jesus tells us exactly what to do, exactly where to go, and exactly who we can trust. John four nineteen. Here we go. Jesus tells us exactly what to do, exactly where to go, and exactly who we can trust. John chapter four verse nineteen says this. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceivest that thou art a prophet. So here Jesus is at the well, and the woman with five husbands comes and they begin a conversation and Jesus has a back and forth with her and she perceives something special about Jesus. And this is what she says. She says, and the woman saith unto him, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. Ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship ye worship ye know not what 
we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews but the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the Father seeketh such to worship him God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth so we see a very special conversation which sets the record straight of once we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, what do we do? Where do we go? Who we can trust? Jesus tells us exactly what to do. We see the woman at the well. She has a specific culture. She worships in a specific way. And she worships in a specific place. That's very important. And she says to Jesus, you Jews have a specific culture. And you worship in a specific way. And you worship in a specific place. And she says to Jesus, who's right? Are we right or are the Jews right? And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, woman, I tell you the truth. The time has come now where worship transcends culture. Worship transcends places. Worship transcends culture. Now we worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It's no longer about where you go. It's no longer about the places that you think are right. It's no longer about the culture that you're brought up in. It's no longer about the customs that you've been taught. Now, it's about worshiping in spirit and in truth. And this worship of spirit and in truth, which must be done because it's the only acceptable form of worship, this is the living sacrifice that we offer to God. We let go of customs, we let go of culture, we let go of places, and we do what Jesus says. We worship in spirit and in truth. True worship. Jesus says true worship must be done this way in spirit and in truth. It must be done according to the spirit and according to truth. What does that mean? What does it mean to worship in spirit? What does it mean to worship in truth? What is truth? What is the spirit? And does being complete in Christ have anything to do with worshiping in spirit and in truth and I will say it does because if we are complete in Christ then we have every tool we need to worship in spirit and in truth so being complete in Christ is the understanding that I now no longer need a place I no longer need a custom I no longer need a culture I need Christ his spirit I need Christ he is the truth and when I have Christ completely by faith I now have every tool I need to worship in spirit and in truth what is truth Deuteronomy 32 4 what is truth Deuteronomy 32 4 here we go Deuteronomy 32 4 stick with us now because we're looking at a big picture and we're gonna see that being complete in Christ right the Messiah, the Savior, being complete in Him is the thing that causes me to have a form of worship that is acceptable to the Father, which Christ calls spirit and truth. Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all, all His ways are judgment. All His ways are justice. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. So what's the first definition of truth? God is truth. Psalm 119, 142. Psalm 119, verse 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. So God is truth. The law is truth. There's a reason why the law is truth. Not because it's a set of rules. Because the law has a very specific motivation or um, intention that God is trying to teach us. Psalm 119, verse 151. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. So God is truth. The law is truth, and the commandments are truth. John 14, 6. John 14, 6 saith this. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's very important. 
why does no man come unto the Father but by Christ? We're going to see why that is in a minute. But Jesus clearly says here, I am the way, the way to the Father. I am the truth, the truth that is needed to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So what do we see? We see God is truth. We see his law is truth. We see his commandments are truth. And we see that Christ is truth. Every single facet of truth is designed specifically to give us a deeper and deeper revelation of who God is, because God is truth. John 16, 13. John 16, 13. How bad when he, the spirit of truth, has come. This is talking about the Holy Spirit. How bad when he, the spirit of truth, has come. He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So here we see a spirit of truth. That means truth has a spirit. That means truth possesses the spirit. That's very important because when we look at what the spirit actually is, we're going to see that it's the spirit of God and that the spirit of truth is actually the spirit of God and who possesses the spirit of truth we're going to see in just a moment John 17:17 17, 17. God is truth the law the commandments Christ is truth and the holy spirit is the very spirit of truth John 17:17 17, 17. sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth that's very important that the entirety of the Bible is truth, right? This entire book, it's has 69 books. It's actually a library. This entire library is truth. But there's a reason why it's truth. We're going to talk about that right now, right? But this is truth in total. This is absolute truth. God, his son, his spirit, his law, his commandments, and the written word. This is truth in total. And each facet of these truths gives us a deeper revelation of the ultimate truth, that God is love. That's, that's the conclusion of the whole matter. We're going to see that right now. Deuteronomy 32, 4 says that God is truth, right? Why is God truth? God is truth because he's the source of all good things. So anything that is good, that comes from God. And it's true. It's good not to lie. It's good not to steal. It's good not to murder. It's good to honor your parents. Go down the line of the law. Go down the line of the Ten Commandments. And when you look at them from the point of it preventing hurt, harm, and danger in the family of God, each one of these truths is good. And it has its source in the mind of God, who when he designed creation, intended a perfect harmonious relationship between himself and creation and between being and being. First Corinthians 8, 6 says this. First Corinthians 8, 6 says this. Here we go. First Corinthians 8, 6. But to us there is but one God. That's the one true God. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things. So all things in existence that are good, they stem from the Father. He's the source. And it goes on to say this. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So there's one God who has a son, a literal son, who he ripped from his bosom and brought forth, he begotten him, and he gave him everything that he has. This is very important, that God is the source of everything that is good. And he gave everything that is good to his son. So Father is the source, Christ is the channel. Mark chapter 10, verse 18. Mark chapter 10, verse 18 says this. 
Mark chapter 10, verse 18 says this, And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. So anything that's good in existence has its point of origin in the Father. Right? When a mother loves her baby, that mother was inspired to love her baby because Father gave his love for that child to the mother, and the mother then gives the love of God to the child. That's how this system works, that God has love for all created beings. And if you love your children, if you love your spouse, if you love animals, if anything in existence, if you consider them more important than you consider yourself, that has its point of origin in the Father. All goodness stems from Him. So if you find yourself lacking in love, simply go to the Father and say, Heavenly Father, bless me with your love for this specific creation. If you find yourself lacking in love towards even people that are mean, bitter, hatred towards you, you can go to them and say, Father, give me of the love that you have for them. So all things come from God. He's the source of all goodness. And he's called the fountain of living waters. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. Here we go. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. So God is the fountain of living water. All life comes from him. Everything that's good comes from him. He is the source, and he has given everything to Christ. So the first and greatest uh, facet of truth is that God is truth. And every other facet that we are now to examine is going to point to the fact that God is love. So very important. Why is God truth? Because he's the source of all good things. He's the fountain of living water. Facet number two, Jesus Christ is truth. Why? Why is Jesus Christ truth? Because he's the son of God. He's the literal only begotten son of God. Christ has his points of origin inside divinity. Christ is not created. He's brought forth from the bosom of the Father. And everything that the Father has, he has given to his Son. All life, all goodness, all creation were channeled into the Son and brought forth by the Son. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. Hebrews chapter, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4. He being, let's go back even one. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the exact express image of his person. Christ is the exact replica of the Father and upholds all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels as he had by inheritance obtained a much more excellent name than they all. Very important that Christ is the inheritor of every single thing that the Father has. Power, authority, wisdom, might, righteousness, holiness, sanctification. Christ is the uh, express replica of the Father. And then Christ, who is the channel of the source, has the ability to dish out life and wisdom and understanding and righteousness to any being that will accept him as Lord and Savior. That's very important. John 13, 3. John 13, 3 says this. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, that he and that he was come from God and went to God. That's very important, that the Father had given Jesus Christ everything. And there is nothing that the Father hath withheld from him. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. 
Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 says this, For by him, for by Christ, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principality or power, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things that are in heaven. You see, the Son of God is the great focal point of heaven and earth. Why? Because he's the revelation of the Father. This is very important. Christ is the Messiah. Christ is the high priest. Christ is the king of kings. Christ is um, the, the, the captain of the host of the armies in heaven. And when there was rebellion in heaven and Satan uh, maligned the character of God, it was Christ's job to set the record straight. When mankind sinned and the whole human race was lost because of sin, it was Christ's job as Messiah to set the record straight. So Christ is the great reconciliation of both heaven and earth as he does his role as Messiah, as he does his role of the hosts of the armies of heaven. He is reuniting all of existence back in unity to the Father. So Christ is so important because he's the revelation of the Father, because he is the great I am, because he is the one that keeps heaven and earth united and reconciled back into the understanding that God is love, that God is trustable, and that as Christ, the only begotten Son, the, the Creator, the Redeemer, the sustainer of even the atoms in our universe, he does this because he does not consider his divinity something that is more important than his created beings. Christ is agape. Christ is unconditional love. And even though he's the son of the, uh, the, uh, of the one true God and all things have been given to him, he considers everything else in existence more important than he considers himself. He's the only one in existence that the Father can trust to keep things united. This is very important. Philippians chapter 2, 5. Christ is the only one that has the capacity to keep things united. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Here we go. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This same mind frame that Christ had of considering others more important than he considered himself. This is the mind that we need to have. Who being in the form of God, right, because Christ had full divinity, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things that are under the earth. And that every tongue should confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That's very important. That what Christ has done, what Christ is doing, and what Christ will do is for the focal point that is going to reconcile heaven and earth so that God the Father will have glorification. So Christ did not use his divinity to his advantage. And Christ is truth because he inherited everything that the Father has. The name God, the name truth is very, very, very important. John 17, 17 tells us that thy word is truth and that we are sanctified through the truth and that the word of God is truth. Why? 
Why is the word truth? This is very important because the word of God, the written word of God, is a revelation of the living word. Jesus Christ is the living word of God. And the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, they are a revelation of Christ. This is why the Bible seems to talk more about Christ than it does the Father. Because it's only as we know Christ will we be able to have the capacity to know the Father. So the Bible talks more about Christ, who's the revelation of the Father, than it actually talks about the Father. So the Bible is truth because it reveals Christ. John chapter 5, verse 39. John chapter 5, verse 39 says this. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The Bible is designed to testify of the Son of God. Luke 24, 44. Luke 24, 44 says this. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the Law of Moses and in the Prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. That's, that's the conclusion of the whole matter. Everything in the Book of Moses, everything in the Prophets, everything in the Psalms tells us, reveals to us, gives us an understanding of who Christ is. And what happens when we get to know Christ? We get to know who the Father is because Jesus literally says, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So God is truth because he's the source of truth. Christ is truth because he is the divine son of God who inherited all things, even the name truth. The word of God is truth because it points us to who truth is. Right? The law is truth because it reveals to us not a set of rules, but the character of God, which is love. Romans chapter 13, verse 8. Romans chapter 13, verse 8 says this. O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his uh, neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So we look at the law as a set of rules, not really understanding that the carnal sinful mind causes our perspective to uh, not be right. We look at the law askew. Instead of seeing the character of God and how it's love, we look at the law as something that's restricting us from having a good time. We look at it as a set of rules of what to do and what not to do. But that's not the case. The law is a law of love. Each facet of the law is simply a revelation of how we should treat each other. This is very important because the law tells us of how Christ deals with his father. Christ has no other gods. Christ does not take uh, the, the, the father's name in vain. Christ does not have an image of, of his father. Christ looks forward to the special Sabbath time as he rests in the bosom of the father, right? Christ would never dishonor his father. Christ would never take life. Christ would never lie because that ruins the relationship he has with his father. And so the, the, the law is a revelation of the mind of Christ and it's a revelation of what God is calling us to do. He's calling us to allow Christ to live in us so that the mind of Christ can be the motivation as we seek to submit to the life of Christ so that the law of love can be produced from us as Christ lives in us. This is very important. Very important that each facet of truth is a revelation of God, right? Each facet. Every time we look at to a different facet of truth, we're looking at a magnifying glass so that we can see a deeper and deeper revelation of who God is with the ultimate conclusion to see that God is love. That's what this whole thing is about, right? Each facet of truth brings me to a deeper revelation, right? The law is a revelation of God's love. The law 
shows me the character of Christ. The law brings me to Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Galatians, Ephesians, Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. This is what the law's intention is. Not to establish my own righteousness. The law is to point me to what righteousness is, which is Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we may be justified by faith. That's what the law's intention was. It was to bring me to Christ, right? And what happened? As I look at the word, as I look at the law, I get a revelation of Jesus Christ. And as I look at Jesus Christ, what do I see? John chapter 14, verse 9. John chapter 14, verse 9 says this. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? So this is a chain of events that brings me to the understanding that God is love. Right? I look at the word, which is a revelation of Jesus Christ. I look at the law, which brings me to Jesus Christ. And when I am beholding Christ, I see the love of God, never killing, never condemning, only loving, only healing, and I see that this is what the Father's like, right? And as I go through this chain of events from the Word and the law to Christ, Christ brings me to the Father. And he brings me to the understanding that as you see me loving, trusting, not condemning, only healing, only taking care of God's creation, he says this is exactly what the Father is like. And I begin to love, trust, and have confidence in who God is enough to let him save me. And this is what the truth is in total, right? It's a revelation of who God is, facet by facet, facet by facet, with the ultimate conclusion that God is love. And that I can trust this God of love. And a lot of people look at the God of love and say, uh, you're focusing too much on love and you're not talking about the judgment or sin or any of those things. We've covered those topics. People for a thousand years, 1700 years, have had the Trinity definition of God and how his power, his authority, his sovereignty supersede his love and that if you don't do what he says, he's going to destroy you. The carnal mind does not have the capacity to do what God says. We need to look at Christ, learn to trust the Father, and learn to understand that this God of love does care about me. He's not condemning me. He's not judging me. And when I trust him, he can then send forth the life of his son into me so that I can then have the capacity to do the commandments because Christ is the one doing them, not me. This is very important this truth and every facet of it comes to the ultimate conclusion as I go through the word, as I go through the law, it brings me to Christ. And then Christ brings me to an understanding of who the Father is, that he's love, that he doesn't condemn me, that he's not trying to kill me in a lake of fire forever and ever, and that he wants to have a relationship with me because he values me and wants to spend eternity with me. It's very important. And the Bible says that he wants to have truth in my inside. Now, when we think of truth, some, we had this definition of God wants me to be honest. But as we look at the definition of truth, truth in its total, maybe God wants something else to be inside of me. Psalm chapter 51, verse 6. Psalm chapter 51, verse 6 says this. Psalm 51, verse 6 says this. Behold, thou desires truth in the inward part. This is David talking about God. And he's saying, God desires truth on the inward part. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. What is, what is truth? God is truth. The word is truth. The law is truth. Christ is truth. And when God says, I want truth to be inside you, he's saying, I want my law inside you. Not because it's a set of rules because it's the definition of love. It's the character of love, 
when God says, I want truth inside you, he's saying, I want the spirit of my only begotten son to live inside you. I want my word in you. I, God, the father, want to dwell in you via the spirit. And he says, then in your hidden part, you will know wisdom. That's Christ. Christ is the wisdom of God, right? And so when God says he wants truth in us, he's saying he wants to live inside of us. God, by his spirit, is asking for us more, to, more than just to be honest. Satan can be honest. He wants to live his life in us. And he does that by his spirit. Ephesians 3.16. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 says this. That he, God, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit on the inner man. And so this is how we receive truth, is by the spirit. Because the spirit is the spirit of truth. It's the spirit of God. And when we have the spirit, it strengthens us to have truth on the inner man. That is very important. These are biblical truths that are going to establish God's people in faith so that God can do a work in them that will replicate the mature fruit of the Spirit. And there's a misconception in the world today that says that the Holy Spirit is a third God. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible does not say that the Holy Spirit is a third God. Let's see what the Bible has to say. Let's see, what is the Spirit? John chapter 6, verse 63. Now, we're not trying to put the Holy Spirit in a box. The Holy Spirit is bigger than this Bible study. The Spirit of God is bigger than this Bible study. So as we look at a, as a, just a few scriptures, let us come to the conclusion that Mr. Brad is not trying to put the Spirit of God in a box and say this is the absolute boundary of what the spirit can do or be we're not doing that we're just looking at a few scriptures and saying this is what the bible tells us the spirit is john chapter 6 verse 63 john chapter 6 verse 63 says this it is the spirit that makes alive so the spirit gives life it is the spirit that makes alive. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. So the spirit gives life. And the words that Jesus spake, they were spirit, they were life. Why? Because faith in the written word causes the living word access in your life to make the promises of God a reality. So the written word and the living word are connected via the spirit, via the life of God. So one definition of the spirit is the life of Christ, the words of Christ. John 4:14. 4, John chapter 4 verse 14 says this, "But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. That's very important because we saw in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, that God was the fountain of living water. And here Christ is saying that I have the ability to give you the fountain of living water. And how, what is the fountain of living water called here? It's the Spirit. John chapter 7, verse 37. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit. So this fountain of living water, which Christ gives us, which is the life of God, Christ gives us this, and it's called the Holy Spirit. This is very important, very, very important, that it's the Word, the living Word and the written Word, working in unison, which gives us life. When we have the ability to believe the promises of God, the written Word, the living Word makes it a reality because He has access to all 
all things of the Father, and he makes it a reality. Very important. That this life-giving essence, which comes from God, Christ has full access to, and he gives it to us. So the Spirit is the life of God, but it's more than that. Oh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 says this, But God hath revealed them to us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. And he begins to explain what that means. For what man knows the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Now here, Paul is saying, What does a man know except for what's in his mind? Only a man knows what's in his mind. And he's saying, what does God know? Only the things that are in his mind. So here Paul is saying that the spirit is the mind of God. This is very important. For what God hath revealed unto us by his mind, for the, for the mind, the spirit, searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So too, what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man, except the mind of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knows no man but the spirit, but the mind of God. And then check this out. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. That means God possesses the spirit. That means it's his spirit that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So if we receive the mind of God, that means we have the ability to have the inner workings of God's mind. And it says this, which things we also speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Not, but the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Very important that Paul is going back and forth here, and he's saying, the spirit, the mind. The spirit of a man, the mind of a man. The spirit of God, the mind of God. What? Who can know what's in the spirit, or the mind of man? No one but the man. Who can know what's in the spirit or the mind of God? No one but God. But when you have the Holy Spirit, God gives you his mind. So another definition of the spirit is not just the life of God. It's the mind of God. And this is very important because we're seeing that as we have the spirit, we are given everything that we need to live the life of Christ. Romans chapter 8 Verse 9. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says this. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, the Spirit of God dwells in you. What does it mean when the Spirit of God dwells in you? We just saw that it's the life of God. It's the mind of God. So, if the Spirit of God dwells in you, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So we're talking about the Spirit of God. And then right away, Paul goes in and says, this Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ. Check this out. So then, they that are not in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Here, listen to this. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead, who raised Jesus from the dead? The Father. But if the Spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also make alive your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwells in you. This is very important. That Paul is doing a back and forth, and he's saying the Spirit of God is the Spirit of the Father. It's the Spirit of Christ. It's the Spirit of the Father. Why is it called the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of Christ? This is very important. That God 
united his spirit with the spirit of Christ. It's a unified life. It's a unified mind between the Father and the Son for salvation, for redemption, and for the perseverance of all created beings. So the Father, who is the fountain of living water, gives everything to the Son. We saw that. He gives life. He gives power. Anything in existence, the Father, who is the source of all good things, channeled everything, poured everything into his Son, who inherited all things including the spirit, the mind of God, the life of God. And now Christ freely has the ability to give the spirit, which is the mind and life of God, to anybody who accepts him as Lord and Savior. And this is for the reconciliation of heaven and earth, so that everything in heaven and earth can go back to the Father in peace, so that God may be all in all. And this is how Jesus Christ describes the unity of the Father and the Son and eternal life because clearly we saw in John 4:14 4, that when we receive the fountain of living water we receive the uh, eternal life that's the life of God that's the mind of Christ when we have that we have eternal life John 17 verse 1 to 3 John 17 1 to 3 says this these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son may also glorify thee. As thou hast given him power, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Christ is here talking about a relationship with the Father and the Christ, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. And he says this relationship, knowing God and knowing the Son, is the direct connection to eternal life. Why? Because as the Spirit channels the life of the Father and the life of the Son into us, their eternal life is given to us. Their mind is given to us. We've seen that clearly, right? In, in, in Romans 8, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, in John 4, we saw that the fountain of living water, which is the life of the Father, Christ has full access to. He said it right here in John 17, 2. He has freely been given the ability to give it to anybody that the Father has given him. And who did the Father give him? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's very important. And that this spirit is the unified life of the Father and the Son for the redemption, for the sanctification, and for the preservation of all created beings that are in submission and loving trust to the Father. So a relationship with the Father and the Son is eternal life. Because a relationship with the Father and the Son is a connection to the Spirit. This is a constant connection to the fountain of living waters. And remember, I'm not saying that this is the complete sum of the matter of the Holy Spirit. I'm not putting God in a box. I'm purposely telling people that there's, this issue is greater than uh, I have the capacity to, uh, to share. But juice down in a moment... We saw that the Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, and it's the Spirit of the Father, united for the, uh, for the reconciliation of all of heaven and earth. Uh, very important. The Holy Spirit is the life of God, the fountain of living water. And God unites his life with the life of Christ, with his Son, because Christ inherits all things from the Father. Even the name truth. That's why the Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth, because... God is truth, Christ is truth, so their united spirit is the spirit of truth. This uni unification of the Father and the Son, this is very important for mankind to have, to have a connection to, to experience, because this is where eternal life is channeled to us. The Father who is the one true God. That's what Jesus Christ said in John 17, 3. Father is the one true God. He's the source of all things. All things come from him all good things come from him 
right? And he channels the life and all good things through the Son, right? And what happens? All goodness, all life come from the Father through the Son. And what does the Son do? The Son takes the Spirit and he incorporates his life into the Spirit. So as the Son trusts the Father, as the Son loves the Father, as the Son believes the Father, as the Son is obedient to the Father, he incorporates those character traits into the Spirit so that when the Spirit is given to me, I now have the love of the Son. I now have the obedience of the Son. I now have the trust of the Son. I now have the faith of the Son towards the Father. This is why their unity is so important especially after the cross because after the cross when christ became a human he now is the bridge between god and man and christ as a human sits as divine on the throne of god with the ability to have victory over sin self satan and the world and he takes that victory of sin self satan and the world and he incorporates that into the spirit and now he can send to humanity who he is, a human. He can send his love, his trust, his obedience, his submission to the Father with boosted in power of victory over sin, self, Satan, and the world as a human for humans. So the unity of the life in the Father is so important that without this, mankind will be lost forever. Mankind needs Christ to be a human. Mankind needs the spirit of Christ in us, not just for victory over sin, self, and Satan, but Christ's love for the Father becomes our love. Christ's trust in the Father becomes our trust. Christ's belief in the Father becomes ours. Christ's submission to the Father becomes ours. And so Christ takes the spirit of God and unites it with his own beautiful character traits, and then he gives it to us freely. Literally, he gives it to us so that the complete life of God and the only begotten life, the only begotten Son of God, that becomes our life. That's literally the conclusion of the whole matter. That's worshiping in spirit and in truth. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 says this. A little far. Colossians 1, 27 to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, <laughs> which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. When Christ is in you via the Spirit, you have everything you need. You're complete in Christ, in sanctification, in redemption, in justification, in the, the kingdom of God, in the strength of the Christ. We have the belief of Christ. We have the trust of Christ. We have the faith of Christ united with his victorious human existence over sin, Satan, temptation, and the world. When Christ is in us via the Spirit, literally, we have everything we need to be complete. But it's only through the Spirit that we are able to receive this. This is why we need to have a proper understanding of who God is, who his Son is, and who the Spirit is or what I should say is how the Spirit operates, because the Trinity, now don't leave, the Trinity counterfeits this, and not doesn't have one God with an only begotten Son and His Spirit, but it says three gods, three personalities in one. And so this is very important to understand because we actually cannot have victory over sin, self, Satan, and the world. We can't believe God. We can't trust God. We can't be sealed with the seal of God when we have this Trinitarian understanding. That's not a disrespect to Trinitarian. But that the reality, the conclusion of the whole matter is if we're serving a pagan God, we're, we are receiving a pagan spirit. It's not hate. It's truth. And when we worship the one true God and we receive the spirit of the only begotten Son, this is absolutely what we receive. If you're here for the first time and you've never heard the truth about the Trinity, message me. We'll talk about it. We'll go over some Bible facts because this is so important. 
that it literally has to do with the greatest end time deception. Very, very important. But when we have the one true God, when we have his only begotten son, when we have the literal life and mind of Christ, this is what we have. Romans chapter 5, 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says this, And hope makes not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. When Literally, when we have the Holy Spirit, we have the love of God. We have agape. We've entered into the beloved. And now, the Spirit of Christ is working in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure, so that we're long-suffering, so that we're merciful, so that we're kind, so that we're patient, so that we don't exalt ourselves above others, so that we don't rejoice in evil, but so that we rejoice in truth. When we have the Spirit, we have the love of God. John sixteen thirteen. John sixteen thirteen says this, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come. He will guide you into all truth. We don't really need to worry about having truth because when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior and we believe we receive his spirit, he will guide us in truth. And when we're ready to grow in truth, he'll bring it to us, right? So it's like a plant that develops. There's a seed and it grows through a process. The plant cannot develop overnight because the plant needs to go through a process so that it's capable of bearing the fruit. And so this is a lesson for us to learn that as truth comes our way and God gives us the strength to incorporate it into our life, he will bring us to greater and greater truths as he sees us ready to incorporate it. So let's trust God. Let's trust the Spirit to guide us in truth, not thinking that we need a Mr. Brad or a pastor or anything, but we need Christ, the mind of God, who will lead us in truth as he sees us ready to incorporate truth. Very important. John 16, 7 and 8. This is what we have when we have the Spirit. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is important for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. This is what the Spirit does for us. It convicts the heart of sin. We need that. We need to know when we're doing wrong and we're doing something that will close out the mind of God in our life. It says that it'll reprove the world of sin. It'll help us walk in righteousness. It'll strengthen us on the inner man to do what God considers right and good and just and holy. And it says that it will help us make godly judgments. There's times in life when we don't know what to do. We don't know where to go. We don't know what is in store. But if we go to God and ask for guidance, for help, the Spirit is there to do that. It's very, very, very important. 2 Corinthians 3.17 2 Corinthians 3.17, now the Lord is that spirit. I really don't know, really, it, it doesn't get any more plainer than that. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But we all, with open face beholding in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. See, this transformation that Romans chapter 12 talks about, this takes place by the renewing of our mind as we receive the mind of Christ. So that old man of sin dies, the old mind of sin dies, and we receive the mind of Christ from glory to glory, from image to image. And we become more and more living the life of Christ the longer and longer we walk with Christ. That seed that Christ implants in us when we're born again that develops more and more and more and more as we live life. And Christ is revealed in us more and more and more as we're transformed into his image from glory to glory, from character trait to character trait. This is only possible by the Spirit. And what ends up happening is that that seed of the Spirit, that born-again process, that new creation, 
that Christ does in us ends up becoming the very life of Christ in me so that Christ, his belief in the Father becomes my belief in the Father. His obeying the Father becomes my obeying. His trusting the Father becomes my trusting the Father. His submission to the Father becomes my submission to the Father. His serving the Father becomes my serving the Father. His praising the Father becomes my praising the Father. His worship becomes my worship. That's very important for us to understand. The, the, the entire life of Christ becomes ours. His spirit becomes my spirit. His truth becomes who I am. So then I can live the entire life of Christ worshiping in spirit and in truth because it's his spirit in me. It's his truth in me. And when I worship, which the Christ said the only acceptable form of worship is in spirit and in truth, when I worship with the life of Christ in me, with his spirit, with his truth in me, it's his worship to the Father in me. That's very important. The greater understanding of what Christ means when he says worship in spirit and in truth is saying that he wants to live his life in me so that he can strengthen me on the inner man so that when truth comes in my life, he can strengthen me to walk in it. And so that the worship that Christ does to the Father then becomes the worship that I give to the Father. Christ in us is how we worship in spirit and in truth. Christ, as Christ was humble, <laughs> that's very important. Christ was humbly trusting, respectfully approaching the Father with love because he knows how to do it. He comes from the bosom of the Father. No one knows the Father like Christ. And that's what he gives us. He gives us a humble, trusting, respectful, loving approach to God. That's what Christ gives us. That's why he says you have to worship in spirit and in truth. Because it's the life of Christ that knows how to respectfully <laughs> and lovingly approach the Father. And when we have the Spirit, we are complete by faith. When we have the Spirit, we have the life of Christ, and he works in us how to worship in spirit and in truth. And as long as we are not cemented in our own ideas as being supreme above the mind of God, he will guide us in all truth, and we won't have to worry about anything, but we'll just have to trust, obey, and submit to his leading. And the life of Christ will be reproduced in us. The seed of heaven is in us now. We've been born again. We trust that. We believe that. And Christ, as he gives us the Spirit, each morning, each evening, double portion on the Sabbath, he's growing that seed in us to reproduce the mature fruit of the Spirit so that we can have God's love in us, so that we can be guided in truth, so that we can make godly judgments, so that we can walk in God's righteousness, and so that when the conviction of sin comes into our ears, we can acknowledge it, we can confess it, we can repent of it, and we can be healed by it so that we can obey the way Christ obeyed, so that we can serve the way Jesus served, so that we can trust the way Jesus trusts, so that we can believe the way Jesus believes, so that we can have faith the way Jesus had faith, so that we can worship God the way that Jesus worshiped God in spirit and in truth. The same way that Jesus did is the same way that we will do in spirit and in truth. Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Okay, Mark chapter 9, verse 23 says this. Jesus said unto him, If thou can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Right? The, the, the things that I'm saying today, they can, they can seem hard. But if we believe, it's possible. It's completely possible. John, 20, John 12, 44. John 12, 44 says this. 
Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. So when we believe on Jesus, we are actually believing the Father. That's very important because Jesus did not speak a word of his own glorification. But all the words that Father gave him, he spoke those. So when we hear the word of Christ and we believe Jesus, we're actually believing uh, the Father. John 7, 38. John 7, 38 says this, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. What were those rivers of living water? That was the fountain of living water. That was the life of God. That's the Holy Spirit. So when we believe Christ, we get the Spirit. Do you believe Christ? Then you get the Spirit. Have you accepted him as Lord and Savior? Then you get the Spirit. Have, do you believe you've been born again? Then you get the Spirit. And to the capacity that you believe is the capacity that you receive. The Bible calls us the bride of Christ. The Bible calls us the bride of Christ. That is very, very intentional. Everything Christ has as a husband becomes ours as his bride. That's Being called the bride of Christ is intentional because everything that Christ has as a husband is given to his bride. His life, his strength, his sanctification, his righteousness, his wisdom, his love for the Father, his truth, his spirit becomes part of who we are because Christ gives everything to his bride so that we can serve God, so that we can worship God in a way that is appropriate, so that we can worship and serve God in a way that is sincere, so that we can serve God and worship God in a way that is truthful and loving to God. We are the bride of Christ. We inherit everything that Christ has, his entire life, his entire uh, spirit, and everything associated with that becomes ours. It's very, very, very important. And we have to go through Christ because Christ is the only one that knows what the Father is like. Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. Matthew chapter 11, verse 27 says this. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knows the Son but the Father. Neither knows any man the Father save the Son, and to he whomsoever the Son will reveal him. That's very important. That It's Christ who knows the Father. And Christ tells us the proper way to worship, which is in spirit and in truth. Right? Jesus said in John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Christ is the truth, but Christ is also the way to the Father. John 6, verse 27. John 6, verse 27 says this. Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life. For the Son of Man shall give unto you for him hath God the Father sealed. That's very important. How does the seal of God have to do with worshiping in spirit and in truth and being complete in Christ? Now remember that the Father sealed Christ. And everything that Christ has is ours because we're the bride. So we have the seal of God. Do we believe that? Or do we think of it something that's unapproachable because the denominational world has beat into us that we need to do something to work and earn the seal of God? The seal of God is placed upon those who completely trust and rely in Christ, those who have truth and the Spirit on the inside, so that the worship that they do is not their own worship, but it's the worship of the Father. It's the worship of the Son to the Father. And so the seal becomes ours because we're the bride of Christ. The same seal that Christ has, who's the husband, is given to the wife. That's absolutely what the Bible says. Christ was sealed because his life, his strength, his sanctification, his righteousness, his wisdom, his love for God 
was acceptable. And God said, this is what humanity needs. God sealed that human being. He sealed that character, which was the express image of God. And then he gives it to us. He gives it to us via the Spirit. It's imprinted into our minds. It's stamped into our character. And when by faith we're unmovable and unshakable, that this is what Christ has given to me because I'm his child, because I'm his bride, then I have the seal of God. Not because of something that I did, but because God loves me and he gives the life of Christ to me completely. Not just in worship and spirit, not just in sanctification and righteousness, but in the literal seal of God. This is something that we have by faith because Christ's life becomes my life and we're sealed by the spirit of truth. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 says this. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 says this. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. If I believe in Christ, if I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior, if I'm born again and I believe that he planted his seed in me, the Holy Spirit, if I believe that, I have the seal of God. And the same life that Christ lives, I receive that by faith, not because I keep the Sabbath, not because I'm a level four vegan, but because the Spirit of God gives me the entire complete life of Christ, even the seal of God. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel, the good news of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It's through the belief of the good news, which is in Christ Jesus, that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. How many people are going to take hold of this and believe it? It's a belief in the completed work of Christ and that I can add nothing to it that seals me. That's the truth, the conclusion of the whole matter. Very, very important. Revelation chapter 14, 4. Revelation chapter 14, 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, having with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their lamps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the four elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women. These are they which were not defiled by denominational churches. For they are virgins. They are pure. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goes. These are they which follow the truth, whithersoever he, it goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Very important that we see a few key aspects. That the, the sealed, those who have the Father's name, which is the character of Christ, they are not defiled by denominational churches because denominational churches restrict you and hold you back from following the Lamb whithersoever he goes. Denominations will absolutely restrict you by their fundamental beliefs and not allow you to follow truth wherever it goes. We need to worship in spirit and in truth. Truth is going to deliver us so that we receive the Father's name in our forehead. If I am not following truth, but I'm restricted and defiled by women, because I, I, I adhere to a set of fundamental beliefs that's not biblical, then I can never receive the seal of God because I'm being held back from following the Lamb whithersoever he goes. This is why Jesus says we must worship in spirit and in truth. The spirit must strengthen us so that we can walk in all truth, 
the life of Christ must be in me so that his strength, his life, his praise, his obedience, his trust, his worship of the Father becomes my strength, my trust, my obedience, my trust in the Father. Worshiping in spirit and in truth is part of the sealing process because it's the life of Christ in me, which is, which is what causes the name of the Father to be stamped across my forehead. Everything that Christ has is ours. Everything. We're the bride of Christ. We are the children of God. And Christ became a human so that he could give humanity his total experience. And to the capacity that we believe is to the capacity that we receive. If we believe not, we simply say, Lord, help thou with my unbelief. And he'll strengthen me. He'll guide me. Worshiping in spirit and in truth is as simple as as believing in the completed work of Christ in my life. If we don't take that serious, we'll never receive the seal of God and we will never make it to the 144,000. We'll never make it through the end time. So we need to trust in the completed work of Christ. And when we do that, a natural repercussion takes place that the love, strength, and worship that Christ had toward the Father becomes mine. And the Spirit naturally will seal me because the sealing that Christ had becomes mine. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the beautiful truths that you've given us. Lord, we see it's completely possible to worship you in spirit and in truth. And that you've given us a warning that no denominational church should hinder us from following you wherever truth shall lead. We see counterfeits in the world that tell us of a false Jesus and a false spirit and a false ceiling. Help us, Heavenly Father, not to fall in those traps. We believe you that you're guiding us in truth. We simply ask, Lord, that you would hold back the winds of strife so that you can continue to work in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. We ask a special Sabbath blessing over everybody who's here. Even if they don't understand the Sabbath or how you give out your spirit in extra measure on the Sabbath. Heavenly Father, bless them with extra portion. Help them to have the peace and joy and mind of Christ and let that cause them to become curious and say, what was that? I need more of it. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We ask that the life of Christ would be fully reproduced in us so that we could worship in spirit and in truth. We thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. Help us to honor you the rest of this holy day. In Jesus' name. I love y'all. Good to see y'all again.